This first video is just going to give a very brief introduction to the finite element method, a little bit on the history, some ideas on the modeling methods, the elements available, and um, a quick a quick introduction to stiffness formulation, assembly, and, and an analysis. This is a rather long video, so if you prefer to go through it in three parts, uh, it's possible. The first which I should be going through now is a history and a, a very brief overview of the method. I'll then move on to element formulations, which I'll be showing for a 1D bar element using different techniques, direct and variational methods. And then finally, just um, a, a quick overview of methods for assembly and solution and a, a brief wrap up of the, of the lecture. First of all, um, a little bit of information on the history of the method. The inventors are usually accredited to uh, John Turner and colleagues working at Boeing from about the 1950s. It was then popularized by a number of academics, Sinkovich, Aguirre, Taylor, Clough, Irons, are some of the names that are usually mentioned. This work would have been done in the 1960s. But I think it's fair to say from about 1970, most, most of the developments we tend to use today had been completed. And the efforts from then onwards tended to be on commercial finite element codes, their development, and user interface software so that engineers could efficiently use these codes, do the meshing, create the data sets for the analysis, and so on. This work up to then was most, mostly implicit finite element analysis. There is an alternative explicit finite element technique that I, I do tend to go through in the lectures. This was originally developed by Mark Wilkins in the 1960s and 70s and largely industrialized by John Holquist for the LS Diner code from about the mid 1980s. If you are interested in a little bit more information on this history, there's, there's a, a book I've given there by Carlos Felipe, and there's a, a, a link to, to get to the PDF file of this, of this book. This just gives some information on the terms and nomenclature we tend to use for a finite element model. You can see a very simple structure there on the left supported, has a point load and some pressure loading. It's uh, located in XY coordinate space. If it's three dimensional, then we'll have a, a Z coordinate direction. The displacements of this structure would be in the U, V and W directions. First of all, a mesh is created. Usually there are codes, uh, softwares available to do this meshing operation. In this case, the model is made up of triangle and quadrilateral elements. It's a 2D representation, two dimensional. The meshing would usually be done in such a way that you could introduce the loading and the supports conveniently, and this has to be done at the nodal points. So for example, the pressure loading would be redefined so that you could introduce the same effective load at the two nodal points. I've indicated there. The point load would require a node to be located conveniently at the same location. The nodes um, join elements together, ensure continuity of the structure, that is that, that those separations occur. occur. Um, it should also be said that the elements are specially formulated so that the, the the line joining two elements is also continuous, that strains are continuous over these boundaries. We, we will come to that later on. You can see the supports there introduced at the boundary conditions. This gives a quick overview of the steps of an analysis would be undertaken by a typical finite element code. First of all, all the data point information would be read in, consisting of x, y, z coordinates. You would then read in the element 
connectivity information. This would be each element number, the nodes connected to that element, and also a material identifier number. Material cards would be read in, control, containing information on mechanical properties, boundary conditions, loads, and so on would also be read in, and control data defining what type of analysis is going to be undertaken. Then for each element, a stiffness matrix is computed. I will introduce this a little later on. This stiffness matrix for each element is assembled into a global stiffness matrix, which depends upon the connectivity of the elements between each other. The applied loads are computed and added into a global load vector. So this would main, mainly consist of zeros except at certain points where loads are applied. The K and the P matrix are then modified to account for boundary conditions. I will also very quickly show this later. The stiffness matrix can then be inverted, multiplied by the applied loads to give a global displacement vector for the structure. Once you have this, you can extract the displacements for each of the elements. And knowing these displacements for each element, you can work out the strains within the element. And then finally, from these strains and the material law, you can get the stresses. So this would predict a the stress and the strain distribution throughout the structure. I will be going into other problems on field analysis, um, but essentially exactly the same operations are done. Instead of a stiffness matrix, you have a so-called characteristic matrix representing how temperature, for example, moves through elements, so-called flux. You'd have a temperature applied temperature instead of load vectors and so on, but the, the essential steps would be the same. Here are some of the popular elements that are used in finite element codes. This is by no means all of them. Uh, it's just to give a first introduction. You can see there on the left 2D triangle and 2D quadrilateral elements. There are variations of these which, which have more nodes to give better accuracy, but these would be the two main ones used. If you moved on to uh, 3D structures, then you have tetrahedron and solid elements for modeling. There are also so-called structural elements, such as bars and beams. A bar can only extend or contract in its lengthwise directions. It doesn't have the possibility to transfer moments or torsions at the ends. A beam can transfer moments and torsions in addition, in addition to axial extension. We then have shell elements, 2.5D shell elements. These are usually thin, so stress through the thickness direction is assumed to be zero, but you can also have 3D thick shell elements which can approximate stresses in the thickness direction. But clearly, if you, if you wanted really accurate prediction of stresses in the thickness direction, then you would have to move over to a 3D solid element. As I say, there are others like membrane elements, joint elements, and so on. At the bottom there are some idealizations where 3D structures could be approximated as a 2D problem. For example, with plane strain, if you have a very long structure in the thickness direction, then you can assume that the strain in that direction would be zero, the stress wouldn't be zero, and you could model this using just a simple section as I've shown there um, in gray, darker gray. Similarly, if it's a very thin section, such as the shells I've just mentioned, then this would use a plane stress assumption, which assumes stress in the thickness direction is zero, but strain would not be zero. There is also the possibility for an axisymmetric simulation, 
in this case if if you have a solid of revolution which has a constant geometry in the circumferential direction and if the loading is also constant in this direction or radially then you could approximate this with a 2d section only this is an example i like to go through with students usually it gives you some idea of how elements could be combined to make up a structure for example if we look at the wheels first each of those spokes is um, pin ended in fact moments are not transferred so you could represent each spoke with a 1d bar element this would be fine you could not use several bar elements for each spoke because then you will create a mechanism. It simply wouldn't work and computationally it wouldn't work either. The rims of the wheels could be modeled with 2D shells. This would be fine. And the tires could be modeled, for example, with um, membrane elements, which are rather like shells, but without any bending stiffness. This would be uh, a reasonable way to model it. You would have to have contact or some other way of joining the tires to the rim, common nodes or contact algorithms. And internal pressure would be necessary to inflate and keep the shape of the tires. But it would be model one modeling approach. The frame itself could be modeled with beam elements you would have to give each beam the correct moment of inertia and the area. That would be fine. Um, the problem is that you will not have any information on the surface stresses with beam elements. So very often this type of uh, structure would be modeled with a fine mesh of shell elements throughout. However, if you did want to have critical information at the interconnection, for example, if we're talking about these regions here, um, where critical stresses could occur, then you might prefer to use solid elements for model in these locations and to use shell elements for these locations. Modern finite element codes then have ways to join these two types of meshes together with tied constraints. That would be particularly important, for example, if this frame was an aluminium frame and you had weld lines. These weld lines can easily break if overloaded and you might want to know the accurate stresses in these locations. The saddle could be modeled with a membrane elements or even shell elements for the skin of the saddle mounted over some kind of a beam structure representing the frame. The pedals themselves could be, well, the cranks of the pedals where the pedals are joined. This would be modeled with 3D solid elements. There is actually a tutorial that might interest you, tutorial four in the book, which um, computes the stresses in this part um, at a, a critical location and uses that as a part of a fatigue analysis or failure prediction. I just wanted here to give you uh, another view on evolution of the finite element method over a period of about 30 years. This is an area that I have been involved in in the past. You can see at the top there a Finite element structure, it represents part of the front of a car, so-called mainframe connected to the firewall and part of the floor. In 1982, this analysis was done. It only had 300 shell elements. Quite a difficult analysis at the time, highly nonlinear, implicit analysis. You have uh, plasticity occurring you have buckling occurring. And this sort of thing would have been a real challenging challenge taking about one computation day to complete. Over a fairly short period, two to three years, things evolved and the first real car crash 
or we like to think of it as a real car crash simulation was undertaken for a Volkswagen Polo. It had 5,000 elements, shell elements, used explicit finite element analysis, which is a technique I will explain in another lecture. But as you can see, it now starts to look something like a real car, at least in the important front part where the crushing occurs. Again, this was a difficult analysis at the time, it took about one computation day to complete, and that was done on a Cray supercomputer at the time. You can see over a period of 12 years, things evolved, the software improved, computers improved, and in 1997, a car-to-car -car crash simulation was managed by BMW 300,000 elements explicit analysis. Again, about one computation day to do this, this type of analysis. And in 2011, this is about the time I, I stopped working in this area, but uh, typical crash models were two to three million elements. And that's, that will have continued as people try to make these models even more sophisticated and accurate. As I mentioned, this is partly due to software improvements, but largely it's due to computing power. Um, and Gordon Moore once said, the CPU power doubles every 18 months. So you can see that trend in these analyses. I once did a uh, comparison between a Cray 1 computer and in, in, that was available in 1985 and a iPhone, I think it was an iPhone 3 from about 2010. They basically had the same computing power, but the uh, the iPhone was a lot cheaper. The supercomputer, I think, was about 10 million euros, and the amount of memory in the iPhone was uh, far, far more than what was available in the supercomputer. So it's really just to give you an idea of the evolution in this field, but that will have taken place in many other areas of uh, finite element analysis. This part now looks at element stiffness. For this, I'm just going to use the 1D bar element, the most simple of finite elements that's available. And I'll be deriving stiffness using a direct method, and then briefly showing um, variational methods that are used based on Galerkin and uh, Rayleigh-Ritz techniques. So moving on, I just want to show you here how we can derive with a very simple method, direct method, the stiffness for a bar element. Here you can see the bar, two nodes. Each node has one degree of freedom u1 at node 1, so this is possibility of displacement u1 at node 1, possibility of displacement u2 at node 2, and each of those nodes can have a force applied. There are two cases considered here. First of all, if we apply p1 at node 1, so that we get this displacement, the external force is equal to the internal force. And the internal force is Ea over L, spring stiffness, multiplied by the displacement U1. At the other node, we're going to hold it fixed with a constraint. And this constraint is a force. And for equilibrium, this force, so if it doesn't move, this force must be equal to minus P1. So P2 is equal to minus P1. In case two, exactly the same is applied, except now you apply a load P2 at node two, giving a displacement U2. And for equilibrium and zero displacement at node one, you have that P1 is equal to minus P2. That leads to these two sets of equations in the center of the sl slide. And at the bottom, you can express those using the relationship shown, where load is equal to something times displacement, and the something is the spring stiffness, EO over L into the brackets one minus one minus one, one. 
in abbreviated notation, we usually express this here, where d is the displacement vector u1 over u2, and k is the spring stiffness. There are far better ways to derive stiffness, formal derivations. I will go through these, but in order to present these properly, we need certain relationships. And the first one here is the definition of how, or a relationship between strain in material and the displacements that take place within the material. So if we could consider this 1D strip of material, rather like a bar, we have a direction x, we consider a length dx. When it's loaded with a load p, that elemental length dx extends to dx times delta x, delta u over delta x times dx. So delta u over delta x is the displacement gradient in the x direction of the material. And dx is, of course, the elemental length. If we use the definition for strain, the usual definition, it's the change in length over the original length. And here we have the change in length divided by the original length dx, which equals delta u delta x. This is then the saying that the strain is equal to the gradient of displacement taking place within the material in the x direction in this 1D case. You will see we, we will be using this in the next slide. Two other important relations are presented here for the 1D element. First of all, we will derive a relationship for so-called shape functions, giving a matrix N, and we will also derive a strain displacement matrix B. So looking at this bar, we introduce two shape functions. First of all, N1. The idea of this is that it has a value 1 at its own node. N1 is associated with node 1. And it reduces to 0 at the opposite node, at node 2. Shape function N2 is the mirror image of this. In fact, it has a value of 1 at its own node and reduces to 0 at the opposite node. So here we have the two shape functions expressed mathematically. As you vary x in those two expressions, you will see that those, those um, curves I've defined do occur. This relation here then uses the shape functions to allow us to obtain uh, the displacement u at any position x along the bar in terms of the nodal displacements and the shape functions. You can put in values of x there and you will see, for example, if x is equal to 0, ux is equal to u1. If x is equal to l, ux is equal to u2. And there's a linear variation uh, between those two as x varies. In matrix notation, we express things like this. You will see this occurring many times in the, in the next lecture, in fact. For the strain displacement matrix, we use that previous relationship on the last slide. Strain is du dx, which means we can differentiate the shape functions, multiply by the displacement vector, and obtain the strain at any point within the element. This expression, differ differentiation of the shape functions, is, is the B matrix, what we always define, define as the B matrix. Doing the differentiation, 1 minus x over L for shape function 1 is minus 1 over L. And similarly, differentiation of shape function 2 gives plus 1 over L. You can see that's correct. Um, if you do the calculations here, 
strain in the element is u2 minus u1, the, uh, the difference in displacements divided by the length. It's also to note for this particular element, the strain is a constant in the element and does not vary with position. For the first of these formal derivation methods, we can use the principle of total, principle of total potential energy, which basically says a structure is in a state of equilibrium between loads and displacements when the total potential energy within the system is at a minimum. So, for example, if we see a, uh, if we if we consider this spring here. Origin, original length LO with a load P applied, it displaces with a displacement U in the X direction. The stored energy within the spring will be the area under the load displacement curve, PU, which is a half PU. We can replace P with KU. And obtain a half KU squared. The potential energy due to the loading is the load times the displacement, PU, and so the total potential for the system is these two are these two energies, U minus W, which is given by the expression here. We can then get the um, minimum of this energy by differentiating this and setting it equal to zero. And that leads to P equals KU, which is the spring stiffness times the displacement given here. The same idea can be used for a bar element. In this case, you've got um, two possible loading, P1, P2 at the no end nodes and two possible displacements, u1, u2, at the end nodes. These are the load displacement vector and the load and displacement vectors. You would use these vectors to obtain the potential energy of the loading. The stored energy in the bar will be the stress multiplied by the strain divided by two, so the area under the stress-strain curve in this case, all multiplied by the volume of the element, length times area. From these two energies, you can get the total potential of the system. You can then differentiate this, set it equal to zero to obtain the minimum. In this case, if you follow those steps through, I've done it in the book, but not here. If you follow the steps through, you end up with a relationship between the applied loads and displacement. And the stiffness is then obtained for the bar element. And it's equal to the same expression as we had before. So it's just an alternative way, a more rigorous approach to get uh, a derivation for stiffness of this simple bar element. The two other important methods to derive stiffness are the Rayleigh-Ritz method and the Galerkin method. I have gone through these in some detail in the book, but I'm just going to briefly mention them here and, and the results that they lead to. The Rayleigh-Ritz method uses is a, is a variational method. You have to choose a functional, which has to be minimized. And for stiffness elements, this functional is actually the total potential energy of the system. So it's minimized, set equal to zero. From this, you can obtain um, a, um, a stiffness for the, for the element. In other problems, like heat conduction, you will have to choose a different functional. And I do go through this in some detail in, in chapter five of the book. The Galerkin method is different. It uses the governing differential equations of the problem and a technique of weighted residuals, which have to be minimized. But again, it is a variational method and there is a minimization process that has to take place. Both of these will lead to this expression here for stiffness 
which for us is very important. Basically, the stiffness of the element is the integral over volume of the B matrix transposed multiplied by E B dV. If you feed in the B matrix for this element, which we've already derived, so the transpose is minus 1 over L, 1 over L, and here it's minus 1 over L, 1 over L, and we only have the simple modulus for the bar element, multiply that out, you will get this expression, noting that the volume is area times length. There's uh, at the bottom here, I just want to mention there are two terms you'll often come across in finite element books, strong form and weak form. A strong form is the derivation or the description of the problem using the functional and the governing differential equations. Once you discretize the problem and approximate those equations using a, a finite element approach, it's regarded as a weak form of the problem. Anyway, for now, the important thing to notice here is that the stiffness is equal to this integral. And we will be using this extensively in uh, video two on stiffness methods for elements, different uh, triangles and tetrahedras and so on. So far, I've done everything talking about stiffness and modulus for a bar element, but exactly the same principles are applied if you're dealing with something that is a 1D flow process. This could be heat, it could be fluid flow, could be some other flow type. So for example, if it's heat, we have a bar element, nodes one and two, there will be a flow of heat between these two nodes, and that flow is given by this equation here, this governing equation. You can then, so th this is very similar to our um, uh, force equals Ea over L times displacement. In um, From that, you can derive this relationship between flow of heat, this is the flux, total flux at the nodes, and the conductivity matrix for an element, and the nodal temperatures. And obviously this is very similar to what we have already had for our bar element with stiffness. Once you have this, the assembly of stiffnesses of, of characteristic matrices, sorry, these, these are called now characteristic matrices, um, the assembly and uh, application of boundary conditions, all these steps are essentially exactly the same. I will be going through this in, in much more detail in video five on heat conduction and field analysis. This final part of this video or lecture is just going to show you how we assemble elements together and perform a solution and I also give a, a brief wrap up, which is um, explaining a, or demonstrating a video you might want to try using FreeCAD and Calculix. This video, I think, is number 12 within the book. Um, and I also highlight some of the things I've had to jump over here that are some of the theories that are more, more given in more detail within chapter one of the book. I'm just moving on here to give you some ideas, first ideas on how we assemble elements. So I've taken two elements joined together. Each has a different stiffness and a different length. So the spring stiffness for the first element is K1, spring stiffness for the second element is K2. One way to assemble these is to imagine that the stiffness matrix for each which is defined here, K1 minus K1 minus K1, K1. I've, I've entered the EA over L into the uh, one minus one and just, just use this term. You extend each of these to the 
third degree of freedom. So the first spring is not actually um, connected to the third degree of freedom. So we just introduce these zeros, which are shown here. Okay. We do exactly the same for the second beam. And then you can simply add these two together. And you end up with this assembled relationship here. There is an important point that I've, um, I've gone through in the book, but uh, not, I'm not going to deal with it here. If these, if these two bars were inclined, something like this, you could not add those st two stiffnesses together as I've done here. You have to transform those stiffnesses into a common frame. So you, each, each bar would have its local stiffness, which would be the same as this. It would be then transformed into the XY frame stiffness. And then you can, and, and you would do that for both bars, and then you can add them together. In this transformation, the two by two stiffness in the local frame becomes a four by four matrix in the global frame, because you now have X and Y degrees of freedom for each of the nodes. As I say, I go through that in the book and this transformation process and also an example which shows how that, how that works, but I'll, I'm going to gloss over it, as I say. The next step is, just to give you an idea, is applying boundary conditions. This system of equations, which I've just shown you, cannot be solved, in fact. The stiffness matrix is singular. The reason for this is that this structure can move as a rigid body and you can have any number of possible displacements in the X direction as a valid solution. To avoid this, you have to introduce a boundary condition which could be applied at any one of these nodes. It doesn't matter which one, but usually we apply a boundary condition which is realistic compared to the problem we're trying to analyze. In this case, I just want to make things very simple. I've constrained the first node and the third node to be fixed. And the process to, to impose those constraints is to place a one in the main diagonal of the relevant degrees of freedom. So this would be the first degree of freedom and the third degree of freedom and overwrite with zeros everything that is in the in the row and column so these these values here are overwritten you also place a zero in the load vector for that degree of freedom you can now invert the stiffness matrix bring it over to the other side multiply by the load and you will end up with the displacements here. Correctly, you have that U1 is equal to U3 is equal to zero, and the U2 displacement is P divided by K1 plus K2. Once you've got these <coughs> displacements, you can get the strain in the element by using the strain displacement matrix. So that's the B matrix. And you will have the strain one is this, you can then multiply the, by that, that by the stiffness of the element to get the stress in that element. You can do exactly the same for the second bar. And another step, which I've shown in the book, but not here, is to show you how you can use the stresses in the bar to work out what the reaction forces would be at the supports of nodes one and three. And clearly, if you've done everything correctly, the sum of those reaction forces should be in equilibrium with the applied load at node two. This is just to show you a little bit more on the assembly for a network. I've kept things very simple here. I'm only looking at um, a, a flow problem. Deli deliberately kept it simple. A flow problem just has temperature or pressure that's being distributed between the nodes. If we were looking at a spring assembly here, then you would have several degrees of freedom, uh, two degrees of freedom at each node. But for a flow problem, 
Um, it's just one degree of freedom, temperature or pressure. Let's say, for example, we look at element six. It's connected to nodes three and five. This means your characteristic terms, stiffness terms, will, appear, will occur in the third row and column, the third and fifth row and column, the fifth and third row and column, and the fifth and fifth row and column here. So you have the K6 minus K6 minus K6, K6 being added in there. If you were to look at element one, connected to nodes one and two, you will see K1 minus K1 minus K1, K1. And essentially you do this for all of the elements in the, uh, in the assembly process. This um, leads to an important point on the numbering of these nodes. The numbering I've done here is very convenient and it leads to the fact that you have all the zeros located towards the corners. And this has the important consequence that algorithms have been developed to actually only assemble this information and not to consider all of these zeros. It also does not consider the information below the diagonal because due to symmetry, we don't need the information. What's here is the same as what's here. All these matrices are symmetric. So the assembly would only be done in that top part for the non-zero information. And the inversion can also be done. The inversion of this matrix can also be done for that information. It saves a lot of computing time. However, if I did the numbering differently, for example, if I went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, element one be would be connected to nodes one and seven. So information would occur here, 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 and here. <clears throat> This would be a very poor numbering system because it would mean I would have to store all of this upper diagonal now and I would have to invert a much larger matrix. So what happens in all of these commercial codes is that you will use any kind of numbering in, in generating the model, but an algorithm is applied to try and minimize the numbering, the node numbering difference between um, in any element to minimize the node numbering difference. This means the storage of information is much more efficient. Um, the analysis will be much quicker. But of course, if something goes wrong and you have an error message or the final results, this information is output according to your original numbering system and not according to some internal numbering. There are many assumptions um, necessary in order to do a finite element analysis and I just want to highlight a few here. You have modeling assumptions at the top there. I hope um, from that example from the bike you could get some idea of these modeling assumptions. We had to choose whether we wanted to use bars or shells, which parts we wanted to model accurate and which ones we could approximate. The loading is not, never very easy to apply, can sometimes be very difficult. The boundary conditions are also not necessarily easy to apply. So there are, there are lots of things there on the modeling assumptions. We have uh, assumptions in the equations of compatibility, that is within elements, um, how the strains vary according to the displacements of the material. We assume that the, this, the strains within an element are basically due to whatever the deformations of the nodes are. 
we have approximations in the equations of equilibrium. That is, there are approximations in the way that the external loads balance the internal loads. The term KD, KD here gives us an, our internal loads. And we also have some approximations in the constitutive laws that we use. For simple materials like a, an elastic material, that may be easy, but as we move on to more complicated materials with the elasticity and plasticity, then the constitutive laws can become quite difficult. And then you will have other approximations in the way that stresses are related to strains. I don't really have any tutorials that are directly related perhaps to this um, introductory material, but uh, there is one on tutorial 12, which involves the flow of fluid through a, a network of pipes. You have a, um, a reservoir at the start, so you have an inlet pressure due to this head of water there. There are different pipes with different diameters. There are transitions between these pipes. There is a valve. Um, each of these pipes will have a different um, empirical law that approximates so-called head loss or losses of flow due to um, friction effects. It's, a, it's an interesting example. I've taken it from the Calculix manual in this particular case is, in this particular case and shown how you can use this within the FreeCAD software to do this analysis. Another one you might want to look at is tutorial four, which does consider the analysis of a crank arm on a bike. Um, it's, a, it's part of a, a, a more complicated example on fatigue life, cycle life analysis or fatigue analysis. Um, but the elastic part uh, is interesting, just how, how you model it, how you apply the loading. It's, um, as I say, related to the, uh, the exercise I showed earlier on with the, the modeling of the bike. There are, unfortunately, several things I've um, skipped over in this lecture. I think if you really want to understand the method a bit more, you have to look at this Rayleigh Ritz and Galerkin method. They become very important in the, um, the next video and in the video five on heat conduction. I've ignored um, the transformation relations for a bar element as you go from an off axis to a coordinate coordinate system. There's also a nice example, uh, a very short example, showing you how you assemble um, off-axis bar elements to get a global stiffness matrix. And one other area I've rather neglected is this, um, is this topic of 1D line elements for different types of flow problems. I go through um, heat conduction in 1D elements and also uh, fluid flow. So I hope that gives you a, a reasonable introduction to the method. The next video will look solely at um, uh, stiffness matrices for different types of elements and uh, in particular how, how these are integrated.